title that was designed to bring attention to the plight of older industrial communities. Across our district here in Philadelphia and state of Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Delaware, and in communities across the nation, too many older industrial communities continue to experience economic challenges from higher poverty and unemployment rates to dramatic infrastructure crises. These communities have unique histories and economic trajectories that may shape their future economic opportunities. And while the issues impacting older industrial communities continue to be at the center of our work, this year we made a strategic decision to change the conference title to Reinventing Our Communities. So it's a small word change, but for us it means a lot. The word our better reflects some of the core considerations and beliefs we have about our community development work at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and the significance, really the centrality of economic inclusion to that work. And so we're gonna spend a lot of time over the next few days talking more specifically about inclusive growth and how we can achieve it. But for us, it really starts with inclusive growth and the fact that it reflects a joint ownership of both the challenges and the solutions that will build long-term sustainable local and regional economies. But I wanna reassure all of our friends, uh, new and old, uh, please know that this is a change of name and not a complete change of focus. We will continue to address uh, but this is the broader array of work that we'll be doing under this heading, Reinvent Unities. So the subtitle of this year's conference is Transform Our Economies. And this is a word that we battled over uh, a little as we were developing the conference theme. We knew that we wanted to frame a conference that focused on solutions rather than a statement of old problem that focused on the future, the past. We also wanted a lot more, ex we wanted to and bring greater focus to the economy as both input to and an outcome of the conditions that exist in low and moderate income communities. We landed on the word transformative because it draws our attention to the things that need to change in order for people and communities to add access to greater economic opportunity. By its very definition, transformation means to change. If we don't begin to do things differently, design communities differently, connect education to work differently, engage residents differently, we can only expect to have the same results that we've had in years past. Those communities that did not have access to resources in the past will continue to lack those resources unless we begin to do th some things differently. So you'll hear me and other moderators throughout the conference asking just that question. What needs to change in order to provide more people with access to economic opportunity? We make progress by asking ourselves hard questions and by not settling for easy solutions. So I hope you'll join me in this exercise over the next few days. Ask the hard questions, engage in the difficult discussions, challenge some of the common assumptions, and most importantly, we ask you to share what you know. Before moving into our first plenary, I want to recognize the many partners who have been so critical to both shaping the content of the conference and promoting it uh, to our network, to their networks. First and foremost, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, the very dedicated work of our system colleagues, the Federal Reserve Banks of Atlanta, Boston, Cleveland, New York, Richmond, and St. Louis. And I also want to welcome our, our newest partner to this uh, rock family, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, I want to strongly encourage those of you who haven't, if you're visiting from a, a, another place in the country and you have not connected with your Federal Reserve Bank, um, I encourage you and those of you who know your banks to please um, really connect with these offices uh, and uh, take the time to visit fedcommunities.org. It is a portal that enables you to really uh, connect with all of the research that's being done across the country by the Federal Reserve System on these key issues of community development. Um, I also want to thank our partners, Penn IUR. Um, Penn's Institute for Urban Research has been our research partner, I believe, for all seven of these reinventing conferences. Uh, together, we have produced uh, four books, uh, and we are working on a collection of essays for this conference. And so Susan Walker and her team have been important, important partners and colleagues as we've moved forward on uh, this conference and other endeavors. I also want to acknowledge and thank the Federal Home Loan Bank, 
uh, and on behalf of the 25 organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations from Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Delaware, I want to thank the NeighborWorks America, um, NeighborWorks America for providing scholarship assistance to those groups. Um, without the scholarship assistance, uh, their participation would not have been possible. So we really want to thank NeighborWorks for their support there. Uh, there are a number of other conference supporters, and you'll see their logos in the back of the conference pa uh, packet. Um, many of these organizations are in attendance, and uh, uh, again, without their help, we would not have been able to spread the word about the conference as effectively as we have, and we may not have uh, gotten some of you here today, so I appreciate that. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank May 8 Consulting and Karen Black, who has been a partner to us um, from the conference design um, through the development and implementation. Uh, Karen has worked very closely with Aaron Mirzwa, our lead on this, uh, and they've done a tremendous job pulling together what I think is a fantastic agenda for the next couple of days. Um, so I need to do a little housekeeping, um, and uh, this is always the, the hard part, telling you what I need from you, but I, I have no shame, I'm going to ask. Um, the first thing, uh, if you haven't already, I encourage you to please download the conference app. Uh, the guidebook um, tool is a very handy and effective way for you not only to know what's going on at the conference, but also to connect to your fellow conference participants. So please, um, if you haven't downloaded, you have a smartphone, if you need some assistance, there's a table out there, they will assist you. Um, please um, take advantage of this resource. The second housekeeping task is, is, is maybe one of the most important. Um, I think I mentioned earlier the planning for this conference started the day after the 2014 conference and it begins with a thorough reading of every evaluation that comes through. Um, it comes back from our participants. I read them. Uh, no matter how horrible your handwriting, no matter how small your complaint, uh, I read them. And the conference is not finished for me until I have taken in that feedback. So I encourage you, I implore you, I beg you, please take the time to provide us with that feedback. Tell us what we should be focusing on. Tell us what issues are impacting your community. Tell us what you'd like to learn more about in the future. We really do read these evaluations. This year you have two options. If you've downloaded the app, you can do the evaluation very quickly on the app um, on, on a daily basis, and you also have paper copies of the, uh, of the uh, evaluation in your packet. So please um, provide us with that feedback. And then lastly, um, we ask you to join the conversation uh, through Twitter. Uh, if you uh, use Twitter, uh, and, and we encourage you to please uh, tweet and connect this conversation that we're having here with your networks out in the field, uh, and please tweet using the hashtag uh, reInvent2016. Um, so those were the three things that I needed to tell you to do. Erin will be happy and she will not yell at me when I get off stage, so please do them all. Um, so to get us started uh, on this kind of couple of day exploration on this issue of inclusive growth, we've invited um, one of the world's most uh, foremost thinkers on this topic to help frame this conversation for us. Um, after we hear from Zav Briggs. We're going to be joined by um, some, a panel of experts to highlight the various perspectives on the tools that we need to build a more inclusive community. Um, but as I said, first, we will hear a keynote address from Zav D'Souza Briggs. Uh, Zav is the Vice President for Economic Opportunity and Markets for the Ford Foundation. Uh, he leads the Foundation's work of promoting economic fairness advancing sustainable development and building just and inclusive cities here in the United States, Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, Zav is also a professor of sociology and urban planning um, at my, MIT. And I have to say, uh, on a personal level, um, this is a person who has blended scholarship and public service in a way that has been a real inspiration to me um, throughout my career. And I know it's been an invaluable resource to uh, a host of you in the room. So I hope you will join me in welcoming Zav Briggs. Thank you, everybody, very much. Huge thanks to uh, Teresa and Deborah and the entire team here at the, at the Philly Fed for the invite to help kick off this important conversation. Uh, as you can tell from Teresa's intro, when these guys give you a homework assignment, it's a, it's a pretty serious assignment, and I, I take it uh, very seriously. It, it's an honor, but it, I have a lot of ground I want to cover with you, and I want to do it uh, quickly enough that we can get to them the panel and hear a wider range of views. And I, I say this knowing the range of roles and disciplines and 
backgrounds and even parts of the country represented in this room. So I'll do my best, and I'm going to move at a New York City pace if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, you know, we at the Ford Foundation, like other funders and a number of global institutions, um, have shifted and sharpened our focus over the last several years to a focus on what I'm going to describe as the imperative of inclusive economic growth. It's certainly not that we've forgotten about poverty. Um, it is not in any way that we're ignoring inequality. We see this as one of the keys to responding to uh, extreme inequality here in America and other parts of the world. But I want to talk about that focus on inclusive economic growth. I want to start with the question of, of why it matters, um, since a, a part of my job is, is, again, to serve as sort of a conversation starter for the conference as a whole. Um, you know, in the U.S. and in, in many advanced economies uh, around the world, the state of economic growth is not pretty. There is a lot to be thankful for and excited about. There is a lot that is quite strong. You saw the recent census news uh, about wage increases in this country at last, and one of the biggest drops in poverty, at least in a single year, um, that we've seen in, in 50 years. It's not that uh, there aren't wonderful things happening. But in the macro, um, in a bunch of the advanced economies, we have the combination of slow growth and high inequality. Slow growth and high inequality, so not, not a pretty picture. And of course, inequality sharply up um, over the last generation plus. There's also a growing evidence base, though, as you know. I'm not going to recount it here because my guess is this room is quite familiar with it. That inequality, especially when it grows to be as extreme as it is in our country, that it undermines economic growth. We hear that from the, uh, the OECD, and Ford has helped to fund some of that work, um, looking at inclusive economic growth and the relationship between measures of inclusion and measures of productivity and other drivers of growth. Uh, we hear it from the International Monetary Fund, which for many years was the uh, spokesperson for a, a, a very different, or the, the, the central mechanism for a very different conception of, of how you grow focused on, on deregulation, on shrinking the public sector, um, and more. The IMF and the IMF director saying strongly, inclusion is actually vital to growth. Equity and growth uh, go together, and they need to go together. It's not just a moral imperative in democratic societies. It's a practical imperative. There is a business case for inclusion. There's an implication to that, too, and that is that inequality affects us all, not just the highly disadvantaged. And that helps to change the conversation or so we believe. We believe it can help to change the conversation, in part because um, inequality becomes our collective problem. Inclusive economic growth become and transforming economies becomes everyone's project. It's crucial. It also makes it more complex, as you know. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment and give a couple of specific examples of things that I think are working. Um, but a focus on inclusive growth does, I think, a few things. First of all, it focuses us on the fundamentals and getting them right. Uh, and I, yes, I am talking about things like infrastructure and human capital and access to, um, to growth capital in particular for communities that have not traditionally uh, been well represented in the entrepreneurial class in this country. Um, and in generating and owning wealth. I mean communities of color, but I also mean uh, communities left behind because of changing technologies, changing industries. So places left behind, not just groups of people of one background or another. Um, and in doing this, in engaging a much wider group of stakeholders, it does something that the traditional, let's say, anti-poverty conversation or even economic revitalization conversation often did not do. So if growth is more robust and more sustainable when it is inclusive, if inclusion is a key to growth, in other words, access to productivity, to innovation, to entrepreneurial capital, to skills, lifelong, to strategies for using the capital and the skills, that matters too, and adequate social protections, things that help you deal with life's ups and downs, safety net is what we often call it, uh, buying power that exists widely across the economy, not just with a narrow few. If all that is true, and there are mountains of evidence that it is, then a starting point for inclusive economic growth is that the basic rules and capacities in the economy matter. 
And that has an implication for government as well. I'm not just saying this because we're on the eve of another big election, but it's not lost on me or you that everything we're talking about here at this conference is, in a sense, on the ballot this November and in, in future elections at all levels, not just uh, the federal level. It's not just about the White House and Congress, obviously, but state and local races as well. How we understand the economy and how it's changing and how you really generate uh, shared prosperity or an economy that works for everybody. One of the things that implies is that government cannot just chase after the symptoms. It has to be a part of changing the rules of the game of the economy itself. Let me give you a quick example, and this issue is familiar to many in this room. Take housing affordability. It's very clear um, that the country's most economically successful regions, I'm going to use region for the moment to mean metropolitan regions, though you can certainly expand on that. Its most economically successful regions are also its most unaffordable, and there's no accident. It's rooted in the things that drive land values that tend to press up very hard on rents, for example. It's one reason that rents, um, particularly on the bottom of the economy, outpace uh, wage growth and outpace uh, the, the level of wages, as I say, for the, for the lowest rungs of this economy. So that's a problem that's concentrated to a great degree and not by accident in the nation's most successfully, uh, excuse me, most economically innovative and successful areas. Um, we have a structural affordability problem. Now, talking that through and talking about how to solve it could take the entire afternoon. I mean to use this example just very, very briefly to say one approach to this is to say we're going to do our thing at the local level and give Washington the bill. We've got housing assistance programs. If rents are unaffordable, we should expand them. And that's not a crazy idea, but you've been watching the Washington movie just as I have been, and I was a part of it not too long ago. And that's a hard conversation in Washington to say, let the federal government spend much more to make up for things that are driven uh, by certain important local decisions, land use policy, uh, commitments to affordable housing, all sorts of things that require real local commitment and the federal government cannot handle on its own. I say that just to say we have a choice, and that is uh, are we going to chase the symptoms of inequality or are we going to do something serious about the underlying causes, the drivers of inequality, including the features of our economy that, uh, that make this such an unequal country. So we can treat this as a wake-up call. Before the recession, this country, against any benchmark, including the other advanced economies, was and still is a remarkable innovator. You know that as well as I do. It's one of the things we are known for, our R&D, our universities, our commercialization of technologies, the innovation clusters, the famous regions, not just Silicon Valley, but others. Yes, we were a remarkable innovator, but also a prolific creator of bad jobs. Let's be honest. That's the economy we had. Now, after the recession, we see labor markets tightening. My friend Harry Holzer will be on the panel in a moment. He can tell you far, far better than I can that those labor markets, the qualities of the labor markets are key to some of the wage gains we've seen. But so too are policy measures um, in red states and blue states, by the way, to raise the minimum wage and to address things like the difference between the main minimum wage and the tipped wage uh, that restaurant workers get. So still, too many people and places uh, left behind. And a real question before is, will we treat this as a wake-up call and change the way the economy is wired as a part of making inclusive growth, inclusive economic growth possible? So how do we make that happen, if that's important? And even if, by the way, we agree to disagree on some of the details of it, if that's the conversation we want to have with each other, if it's important for all communities across the country and people of every background, how would we actually do it? Well, I think you can start with some of the known, some of the broad prescriptions. You need things like equitable infrastructure, infrastructure that's modern and robust and resilient. It's physical. It's also digital. Um, but also equitable access. That means connectivity to, to poor communities, for example. I'll give you a couple of quick examples in, in just a moment. Yes, it means access to skill development, things like alternative credentialing, different ways of showing what you're good at, and taking passports or credentials throughout your career. It can't just mean traditional degrees at every level. Um, we see innovation in those areas, and that's very important. 
it can't just mean jobs. As you know, it has to mean quality jobs. It has to get to the quality of work. Um, and that's true, by the way, even if we're talking about non-traditional employment or, or work that's contingent. It's based on, on contracts um, with suppliers rather than steady, multi-year, lifelong relationships with particular employers. And yes, it has to mean growth capital as well. So those are broad prescriptions, none of them crazy, ton of evidence on each of them. I don't have to tell you, infrastructure, skill development, growth capital, absolutely. But those are very, very broad. What, what more, what else matters? Uh, well, first of all, I think it's significant that there's space for new conversations, for bolder reform, for transformation. Um, at the state level, at the local level, um, and possibly at the federal as well. And all of that depends on elections, but, but a whole lot more. Not just elections, but that thing they call governing, which is supposed to follow elections. For example, room for different conversations. Would you have predicted two, three years ago that trade agreements and the impacts of trade on American workers would be front and center in the way they have been over the past year? Maybe you would have, but not, not everyone would have predicted that. The so trade agreements, how should a new generation of trade agreements be constructed? How do you create more of a race to the top around the world, labor standards, environmental standards, and so on, rather than a race to the bottom? Raising the wage floor, again, was just not in the conversation. Arguably, there was very little room to have that conversation over the last generation. Um, talk of raising the minimum wage was often dismissed out of hand as, uh, as threatening many millions of jobs, threatening to remove the on-ramps for people. Um, particularly the disadvantage of those at the outset of their career. The conventional wisdom on that has shifted. Still have a long way to go, but we've seen, again, in uh, red states as well as blue states, action to raise the minimum wage and also to address this century-long disparity between uh, the, the required minimum and the so-called tipped minimum wage, which, by the way, originates in slavery and the years after slavery when employers did not want to pay their former slaves they wanted customers through their tips to pay them. That is a wrong that we still have to right in this country. Trade agreements, the wage floor, the safety net. Around the world, they call it social protection. If you want to talk to our friends in the developing world or in Europe or Australia or Canada, they call it social protection. It's what we have usually call the safety net. Catching up and do adding things like paid leave that every other advanced economy has, that's a piece of it, but so is reinventing the way benefits work for a changing economy. Creating more portable benefits uh, that, that move with you, regardless of what region you're in, regardless of who you work for, regardless of whether you're a contractor or in a regular employment relationship. There's room to have those conversations now. It is urgent that you all be a part of them. It is urgent that we have people from multiple perspectives saying, this matters. This matters for inclusion and therefore for growth. We're not going to have a strong and robust economy that works for everybody unless we address some of these things. I'll point you to just a, a couple things. Sorry, it's a, it's a hazard of a, uh, of, a, of a recovering professor or a professor on leave. If you missed Danny Roderick's uh, op-ed last weekend in the New York Times, about how we have to fundamentally rethink trade and globalization and how we can do it in a reasonable way. I commend that to your attention. Last weekend, New York Times, Danny Roderick, or Joe Stiglitz's work, uh, work that we at Ford funded, uh, MacArthur and others also supported it, on rewriting the rules of the American economy, rewriting uh, some of these rules that we've taken for granted over the past 30 or 40 years. But here's the thing. I am all too aware that there's still too few roadmaps for local communities that are working to find their way to enhance competitiveness, to grow what they export, to create on-ramps as they do those things. There's an ongoing tension, I think we need to be honest about it too, between certain short-term incentives, sometimes political and institutional, um, between short-term incentives, incentives to, to think and act in the short term, on one hand, and the, and the kind of patience and sustained effort that transformation, that word in our conference title, that deep transformation actually requires. In other words, there's a misfit between how we've done a lot of economic development traditionally, um, including chasing companies, including the so-called attraction game, and on the other hand, doing the transformation that can take uh, years, and in some cases, yes, Generations. I learned a lot about this in Pittsburgh, among other places. About a decade ago, I was working on a book called Democracy as Problem Solving. 
and devoted a lot of it to economic restructuring. So a lot of it was about older communities and, and reinvention. And the idea was to create an opportunity for regions like Pittsburgh to learn with and exchange with counterparts in Brazil or the UK or Italy or other, other parts of the world, not just to think about America. And Pittsburgh, to make a long story very, very short, yes, had false starts after the collapse of Big Steel and, and mixed signals about where the economy was going, but also all sorts of, of green shoots and unexpected vitality. So I give you an example of this to say this is the kind of thing we need to better understand about changing economies and how to find our way at the local level if we can get federal and state government also to, to play their part. One of the stories I loved about Pittsburgh, one of the things that the, the Pittsburghers taught me, the people who really understood the economy there and have been working to develop it, was how steel producers had, had gone away. The economics of that industry had changed in a fundamental way and it led to, as you know, a massive loss of, of good jobs, of traditionally unionized jobs. But hidden in plain sight, if you will, there were many steel suppliers who had grown up around those producers over many, many years. And now they were flying out all over the world. They were going to the steel producers wherever they were, India, South America, Africa, other parts of the world. And that steel supplier industry, in other words, an important part of the old economy evolving and transforming itself and becoming a part of the new, was still providing a huge share of regional wages and regional uh, uh, product, if you will, of economic growth. That's the sort of thing that was hidden in the traditional ways of looking at industry and having these very either-or sort of simplistic uh, conversations about a new knowledge economy and an old manufacturing economy. It missed entirely um, the fact that parts of the old were being reborn in the new. There are a couple of other things I want to hit on briefly as I wrap up here and we bring up the panel. Um, number one, it worries me that we have a narrative about the innovation economy in this country that is still almost oblivious to inclusion. You may or may not agree with me, but I feel strongly about this. It is almost oblivious to inclusion. I'm saying that as an MIT professor on leave. I'm saying that as a, as a graduate of Stanford Engineering. I'm saying that as someone who is uh, grateful for the many things that these innovation clusters uh, provide this country and provide the world. They have not done their job on inclusion, and they've been largely blind to it. Um, it's literally not on the screen, no pun intended, uh, of how we think about the innovation economy. And in fact, innovation in a number of ways and the way we let the innovation economy function is compounding inequality between people and places rather than reducing it. So there are a number of systems we need to tackle. As you know, education and workforce, sector development, community economic development as knitting neighborhoods to the, to the larger drivers of regional change. Infrastructure planning and finance is a huge one. Let me give a, a couple of quick examples of some hopeful things. We need, a, we need a, a division of labor that makes sense. I think when it comes to basic rules and economic security, a number of them are most efficient and they're most universal and they're most reliable if the federal or state government or some combination of those two uh, takes care of them. That's certainly true of the safety net. With some exceptions, you just do not want a nation of thousands of little safety net sandboxes where the rules are, are, are really different one from the other. It just doesn't make sense. We need recipes for inclusive innovation, for growing productivity in ways that include the on-ramps um, for too many people left left behind. And here are a couple of really quick examples of, of things that make me hopeful. The Ford Foundation about a decade ago wanted to address the, the issue of vacant properties and abandoned buildings. And one of the things we worked on with many, many partners, uh, too many for me to, to, to thank and, and call out right now, is the fact that in older communities in particular we had land use statutes and systems for uh, clearing and assembling land that as many folks in this room know very well were simply outdated. Um, in too many cases, they were obsolete. They needed fundamental reform. Now, lots of things have made a difference, and the, the full story would take more time than I have, but land bank authorities and much more have been a part of it, and I want to call out partners like the Center for Community Progress and many, many in the public sector and university life and so on that have been a part of updating our thinking and our systems in ways that are really crucial for these next steps we need to take. Transportation equity is another biggie. And I want to call to your attention uh, efforts like Mile High Connects in Denver. Simply amazing, really bold, really holistic, thinking about the range of things that people need to get to, the things they need, the transit system and all the connections in transit 
the fundamental rethinking of mobility, which is upon us whether we like it or not, uh, thanks to technology and other things. Or the Twin Cities, which is using racial equity as a success marker for judging its public transit and other major public investments. Traditionally, state of good repair, trip times, there's a whole vocabulary. If you're an infrastructure a person, you know this. If you're a transportation engineer uh, or have worked in this field, you know this. But racial equity, um, equitable access to those big systems uh, that rely on public investment. Medellin, Colombia, and I'll wrap uh, with this example. Medellin, Colombia, after years of violence, so much of it driven by narco-trafficking, of course, and the awful civil war, which seems to be uh, uh, about, at last, com to come to an end um, if the peace process is fully successful. After so much violence, after being a kind of um, iconic example of a violent, ungovernable city, Medellin, Colombia has bounced back in an amazing way. It's an incredible place to visit and learn from. It has focused its biggest infrastructure investments, its most powerful upgrades on its poorest neighborhoods for all the reasons I've been talking about. You see it in transportation linkages, you see it in state-of-the-art community libraries. The very finest and best and most digitally connected are being, being put in the poorest neighborhoods. It's extremely impressive. You see it in efforts like the New Economy Initiative in Detroit, which also we've been privileged to be a part of uh, as a foundation working not just with Main Street mom and pops, but with growth companies, and working very hard at racial inclusion as they do it. And you see it in economic planning as well, um, including older regions and, and newer ones. In conclusion, inclusive economic growth is urgent. We see the signs that it is doable. It is an all-in proposition. Uh, we see elements of the playbook, not a complete one by any stretch, let alone a formula. But we see it in efforts to address disparities and to know that doing so is vital to creating an economy that actually works for everybody, that is ultimately uh, for the benefit of a very broad cross-section of stakeholders, of constituents, and yes, of voters. It is not just about the highly disadvantaged. And it means agreeing that these problems uh, are worth solving and that this is a public narrative, too, that we can use, that we can educate the media uh, to use when it comes to understanding the economy and what it will mean to make it work for everyone. I hope these ideas, I hope these quick examples are helpful to you. I'm excited about the conversations you'll have over the next couple of days in which you can help us to learn. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, come on up. Um, we're going to be joined uh, by uh, the members of our panel. And while they're getting up here, I want to thank you once again, Zab. That was fantastic. Um, you do take your homework seriously. So obviously, you're, um, you, you are uh, our favorite student today. So thank you. Um, we are being joined on the stage by some leading experts in a number of fields. And so uh, the bios are in your packets. I'm very quickly going to do a round of introductions. We're joined by Lance Freeman, Professor of Urban Planning at Columbia University, Harry Holzer, Professor of Public Policy at Georgetown University, Andreas Rodriguez Pose, Professor of Economic Geography at the London School of Economics, and Susan Wachter, uh, Professor of Real Estate and Finance uh, at the Wharton School here at the University of Pennsylvania. I want to thank you all, and I want to jump right into the conversation because I, I am excited. Um, I have asked. Uh, Zav to remain with us and to co-moderate this session, so to speak. And um, but I must warn you that um, he has a hard stop at 1:30, and we're going to let him get out of here. Uh, so if we really get into it, you may see him fade away. It's not because of the questions you asked. Um, I am also going to let you know that we are going to. I'm going to do a first round of questions, and then I'm going to um, ask you if you all have any questions that you want um, to ask of our panel. And I encourage you. Um, start thinking of those questions now because I'm sure you have a lot. 
um, uh, that you want to start talking about. Um, as I said earlier, this whole notion of research informed practice and infusing research into the conference is, is, is critical to um, our department and, and other departments across the system. We have been working with Penn IUR to develop a series of papers that really dig into these topics. So each of the panelists you see here are contributing an essay uh, to a collection that we intend to submit uh, for a cityscape article, a uh, cityscape uh, um, issue uh, in 2017. Um, so uh, I'm going to do a first round of questions and I'm going to encourage our panelists uh, to take a few minutes and really dig into these issues um, to provide our, our attendees with some, some sense of what those uh, discussions are like in your papers. Uh, you can find a summary of the papers in your conference packets and if you have the app, you also can access the full drafts of those papers. So um, you do have those, those resources in front of you. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to jump in and pose the first question to Susan. And I'm going to start with uh, you know, talking a little bit about the economic restructuring that Zav uh, referenced in his comments. Um, and these are economic shifts that we are all familiar with, this movement of people and, and jobs out of older industrial places. And what's really happened is that there's been a changing landscape of economic uh, opportunity. Um, and, and also the point that Zav made so accurately in his comments around uh, the fact that most of the, the most innovative places are often the most unaffordable. Susan, I want to ask you to talk a little bit about how job location and housing uh, access intersect uh, to either create or prevent economic prosperity for specific communities. Ter Teresa, the um, points that you have made and saw earlier are so important because this is not a temporary shift in opportunity and inequality. This is a, a long-term shift. Uh, and place-based disparity that is now clearly evident is, is growing, and the question is why? Why this long-term shift to place-based disparity? And I think that we'll hear more from other panelists, but this is newly the age of innovation and newly the age of cities where innovation is occurring. Cities are incubators of growth. And cities with this advantage of, in, of incubating growth and productivity uh, are, are dense and unaffordable. And the regions they are part of, the growing regions with jobs, are dense and the rent is just too damn high, as are housing costs in general. But this is a challenge that's so apparent that perhaps we're not aware of how new it is. In fact, for over 100 years in the United States, population flowed reliably from low-income areas to high-income areas. Why is this? Because there was affordable housing in high-income areas. And this opportunity then to move where the jobs are, because the rents weren't too damn high, because the rents were affordable, led to long-term convergence of regional incomes in the United States. But this convergence has been replaced by a new divergence, place-based divergence. And this divergence is accompanied as I, and due to the increase in rents and housing costs. And it is clearly shown up in the big numbers of mobility. Uh, physical mobility, and we are known for it. We'll hear from Andres in a moment about European uh, e economies perhaps, but in the U.S. we're known for mobility, job mobility, physical mobility, which was in 1950 and for decades 20 percent. It has now declined by half. Mobility is now 10 percent and low income unskilled workers uh, more so, declines have been uh, uh, particularly uh, difficult. And this decrease in mobility is occurring in the context of overall stagnation of income with median income, median income in 2015 the same as it was in 1999. So what's the good news? The good news is that we also now know from academic research, academic research that Zav Briggs has been uh, at the forefront, that regional opportunity is also real. That is, much of the difference in intergenerational mobility, what I'm speaking about here, in the work of Raj Chetty as well as others, much of the intergenerational mobility 
is not due to characteristics of people and their families, but due to characteristics of the places where they grew, where the children grew up. So this long-term impact of where children grow up in terms of education, in terms of income segregation, in terms of racial segregation, these factors are critical for intergenerational mobility, and we now know this. We know this not we know this from MTO moving to opportunity work that Zav and I both were involved in when we were in government, and now is showing these dramatic causal effects of where you live, access to education matters for your future. So uh, that means that this new prosperity that cities have also leave open the potential for shared prosperity, for creating communities that are generators of shared prosperity in terms of house, affordable housing, jobs, training. And we'll hear more about these options, as well as physical access that Zal pointed to, to where the jobs are. Uh, so communities can do a great deal to ensure the benefits of economic growth are shared. And of course, this is why we're all here, and particularly why we, you, are here, who know and are, are, will make the difference on the ground. So it's a great pleasure to be working with Therese on this conference. Thanks, Susan. Uh, so you touched on a number of, of things that uh, we're going to dig a little bit more deeply into. We're going to talk to Lance a little bit more about um, housing costs and the pressures there. Um, we also have a, a paper that's available on education, which digs a little bit more deeply into educational reforms that actually work. Um, uh, but and, and we'll have a panel on, on that topic later during the conference. Uh, but before we get to those issues, um, I want to ask you, uh, Harry, to talk a little bit more about jobs. Um, I think you know. Bob touched on one of the most critical um, issues that we've been thinking about at the Philadelphia Fed, and that's the fact that you know um, not all jobs are created equal, and you know, <laughs> and if you're not doing yourself a favor if you're creating a lot of bad jobs. Um, but I'm going to give you a multi-level question, uh, so be patient with me. Uh, so there are at least two sides of the job market. There's, you know, the demand side and the supply side. And in order to be effective, communities really need to think about aligning their workforce and their economic development. So I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about um, those effective programs, not just the effective programs you've seen, but the policies that are needed to create that alignment that um, plays into creating these places of opportunity that Susan has outlined. Well, well, thank you, Teresa. Um, I, I do think uh, the job market is critical uh, if we want growth to be inclusive. Why do I think that? Well, I'm a labor economist, right? So obviously, I think my stuff is going to be central. Uh, but, but there's a stronger argument, and the stronger argument is that it's, it's through the labor market, it's through earnings, that that inclusive growth is going to be experienced. So getting this right, getting the demand side right and the supply side right and, and the links between them I think are really critical. So I'm going to say a little bit about each of them. And the demand side in the labor market is employers and the jobs they create, the quantity and quality of the jobs they create. The supply side is the workers and whatever skills they do or do not bring to, to those jobs. And then the issue of access, especially in, in our large metro areas uh, and, and especially for our minority citizens are, are disadvantaged folks uh, living in neighborhoods that are somewhat isolated uh, and have difficulty accessing good schools, good jobs, et cetera. Uh, so I want to say something about each of those things. And I think each of them requires some thinking and some strategy. So on the demand side of the labor market, you say, okay, are, are, are there good jobs out there that employers are having trouble filling? The answer is generally yes. Um, and, and there's a set of sectors that are high demand, high growth, good paying jobs below the level of a BA, and employers have difficulty filling them. Uh, and we know what those sectors are. They're the same in every region. It's healthcare, advanced manufacturing, IT, transportation logistics, high end of retail, high end of hospitality, and, and, and a few others. Um, and and there's, in each of those particular skills employers seek that they have trouble filling, they're going to have even more trouble when the baby boomers retire which makes a lot of them very nervous right now. Uh, but those are areas where the strong demand that right now we can try to target skills to meet. But I think we need more than that. I think we need to move beyond just that set of sectors. Um, and one way to think about that and think about economic development, uh, broadly speaking, or very generally speaking, think of two strategies for firms uh, that are in competitive markets. 
uh, and we call those high road or low road in terms of human resource practices. You can compete on the basis of the lowest possible labor cost you can get. And that means you're willing to live with high turnover and shoddy work and things like that. Or you can beat on the basis of the high skills of your workers, their higher productivity and the higher quality of work they do and the lower turnover. Uh, and those are choices that firms make. And, and historically, for decades, we've known firms can choose to be in one or the other or somewhere in between. And even they often compete against each other. You know, you might think of, and, and you know, what are the well-known firms? You know, UPS, Southwest Airlines, Costco, uh, well-known for, for investing in those high road strategies. And, and over many years, Costco actually competes with a firm that we often think of as a low road firm, Walmart, which actually is making a big effort now to sort of move to higher road. So firms make those choices, and the question is, can we, can we induce or can policy induce more of them to go the high road, to create more high quality jobs uh, for workers to fill? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Zav mentioned one approach, raise the minimum wage, just bring the floor up. Uh, I tend to think that's a good idea as long as it's not too high, but that's, that's going to touch maybe the bottom 10% of your workers. You need more than that. I think governments can play a role through financial incentives, through technical assistance, through preferences in, in, in contracting and procurement, and even through the bully pulpit and convening opportunities to push that idea. And interesting, if you want to see an area that's doing this the, in Chicago, the Chicago uh, Civic Alliance is running a big project to encourage high road economic development. And of course, this is very different than traditional economic development, right, where, you, where one state tries to bid away each other's employers. That's a lose-lose strategy for everybody. Uh, but the Chicago Civic Alliance is working on organizing the biggest hospitals to sign on to this. The Office of the Mayor is very supportive. So, so that's an effort to watch. So, so let's assume there are going to be some good jobs out there to fill. Then you've got to worry about the supply, uh, the skills, and, and, and do workers have the skills to get those jobs. Uh, and, and there's a lot we can say about skills uh, and a lot of K through 12 stuff that other people in the room know more than me. We talk about sort of higher ed, especially community colleges, where we expect people often to be educated and trained for these technical jobs, good paying sub BA jobs. We send a lot of people to community college in America, millions of people often with Pell Grants and other supports. But, two, but the outcomes are terrible. Number one, the completion rates are extremely low on average, and especially when you look at folks from these communities um, and number two, even when people get degrees, too often they're not the ones that the labor market tends to value. You know, a lot of people get AA degrees in general studies or liberal studies. There's almost no market value at all. And if you say, well, why is that happening? Why are so few people completing or completing the wrong thing? It's partly the issues that a lot of the students bring to the market, you know, poor skills, poor work experience, pressure to earn money, which keeps them from studying full time. Also some problems with the institutions. You know, the community colleges are under-resourced. We expect them to wear a huge number of hats and to juggle traditional academics and workforce stuff, et cetera. And then I think there's another problem. I think the incentives are not strong for the community colleges to be, really be responsive to the demand side of the market. They get the same subsidies per student for seat time, whether people finish or not, no matter what they study. And in fact, a lot of the high demand stuff on the technical side is actually more expensive for them, right? Equipment costs are high, salary costs are high. Under the current funding structure, it's simply irrational for them to, to invest a lot in teaching capacity. So those incentives have to change. So, so I think what has to happen is we want to inject more resources into the community colleges, you know, well targeted on these workforce activities and, and supports for poor students. But we have to change the incentives and create accountability. And a lot of states are moving in that direction already. But I would like the accountability to be not just based on educational outcomes, also on employment outcomes and earnings of their students. And not just the earnings of all students, but especially the earnings of, of minority students and disadvantaged folks from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I think if they have resources and much stronger accountability based on the outcomes, they'll work a lot harder to expand that capacity and provide the services. And, 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 and there's a whole range of things we do. We, we know we can do reforming developmental education, reform, reforming financial aid, a whole set of services, career counseling, tutoring, that could be effective, and expanding these workforce-based programs, the sector-based training programs, you know, the partnerships between the employers and the community colleges, the career pathway models, the high-quality career and tech ed starting in high school, not old-fashioned book ed, high-quality career and tech ed, like career academies, uh, even work-based learning and, and apprenticeships. There's wonderful examples out there uh, of all these models being done. Uh, if you want to look at the federal level, there's a program called HPOG, 
that the Department of HHS has been pushing, health professionals opportunity grants. You want to look at a state-driven model, Kentucky fame, heavy on apprenticeship, heavy on orienting towards manufacturing employers. If you want to see a more local model, Quest, Project Quest in San Antonio, based on partnerships between the community college uh, and, and local employers. A regional example, Wisconsin Regional Training Partnership uh, in Milwaukee. And there's many, many others, some of which have been rigorously evaluated. Those models work. Scaling them up is tricky, but, but I think that's the goal, uh, and, and that's where we would go. And finally, just a word about access. Uh, and you know, we know so many folks uh, live in isolated communities, segregated communities, segregated by race, by income. And there's a huge literature on this. And, and Zav has written vastly more on how do you move people to the better neighborhoods, or, or how do you bring jobs to those communities. I want to do something sort of simpler. How do you guarantee that folks in those isolated neighborhoods have access to good schools and good jobs no, no matter where they're located in the metro area. Um, you know, there, there's good charter schools that are being pulled away from strictly a neighborhood focus. There's community colleges, there's other training providers, there's good employers. How do you make sure that folks in those communities have access? A couple things need to, they need. Number one, of course, they need information. Uh, and a lot of folks in those communities really don't have the information about the training opportunities, the education opportunities, where good jobs are located. Uh, and how to get there. Secondly, of course, there's a set of services that are very important, transportation, childcare, that goes along with, with the information. And finally, I, this is a tall order for a lot of folks to do on their own. So I think intermediaries play a very important role here. Intermediaries who can connect the workers, the community colleges, and the employers, but who can bring the employee to the employer and make the case for why, for why they're a good investment. Um, and, and I think all those pieces together you start to make, uh, make progress on the access side. And, 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 and it's a lot of stuff to worry about, a lot of stuff to focus on. But if you can make at least some progress on all three of those big dimensions, demand, supply, and access, uh, I think we can make some progress in this area. That's great. Uh, Harry, if we have a chance, I do want to go back and talk a little bit about regionalism and collaboration because I think that that's, um, while most of our conversation is really focusing on the local level and, and working on uh, thinking about what cities and communities can do on their own, I think this whole notion of regionalism and finding uh, effective examples at the regional level will be very instructive for us as we continue our conversation. I'm going to um, move over to Andreas uh, because uh, uh, Andreas has probably traveled the furthest to join us here and, and uh, we're very grateful to have you, um, we would want it to bring you all some international examples of what's working around the world in, in terms of inclusive growth. Um, and um, you know, Zav made the point in his opening uh, keynote that government matters. Um, and your work. Uh, Andreas really looks to the local level and saying that, that that's where government not only works, but maybe it even works best. Um, so I really want to ask you um, to talk a little bit more about why local uh, level activity is um, the best place to make decisions. And I want you to reflect on um, how local capacity uh, may impact a community's ability to pursue inclusive growth and what do we need to do to build community capacity uh, in that regard. Right. Thank you very much, Theresa. Um, well, I think uh, when uh, Sav the Sosa Briggs uh, did the introduction, he described it very well. We are in a period in which what we have is uncertain growth. Some places are growing fast, some places are growing less. But what we have, and that's becoming universal, is increasing inequality. Um, uh, places are becoming more unequal, and this is at the level of nations, but also within regions, within cities, and within our communities. And, uh, one thing that one is not connected to the other. So the more you excel in terms of economic growth, is not necessarily that you're going to reduce inequality. Sometimes it's, in, it's linked to increase inequality. In the case of the US, for example, when we look at cities that pursue excellence in innovation, the Austins, the San Diegos, the Seattles, uh, Charlotte, for example, they are not cities that are particularly good at reducing poverty or addressing raising the wages and the level of employment of those at the bottom of the pyramid. So that's one big challenge. But the other change that we have seen and has been a bit of notice is that before, for those that could not find jobs, that did not have the level of qualifications to compete in more open markets, the solutions used to come from the central government or the national government. Um, central governments, national governments, federal governments have become the world over much less active than they were before in this. Probably they are wary that they have failed far too many times. 
But this has also come with a situation where a lot of local authorities at state level, at local level, even within community level, have become empowered. And have become empowered through two, two mechanisms. One's through formal devolution. Many countries have given more powers, have decentralized more powers to uh, cities, for example. But also through the fact that they have realized that they are alone. That if they don't take action, no one is going to take action for them. So they need to take the bull by the horns and find solutions. So this empowerment is being applied in very uneven ways. Some places across the world, some communities, and in very different ways within countries, some communities are actually doing things, others are very, very passive. But those that are doing things are changing. Not that they are all successful, but they're doing uh, things. And this is not any more about generating more welfare. This is not about greater cohesion. It's about tapping on the resources that you find across every territory and every community and try to, trying to make the most of it. It's about generating wealth. But because it is the communities that are trying to generate this, this wealth for themselves is not any sort of wealth, not any sort of jobs. The jobs have to be durable, they have to be sustainable, they have to be what the ILO was calling until very recently, decent jobs. Jobs that are going to sip throughout all scales of society to make sure that um, it's inclusive and to avoid social problems, political problems, and economic problems that might come with any sort of jobs and uneven uh, development. And the question is, this is being taken unevenly, but does it work? Has it worked? And that's where we still don't know. Sometimes it's very recent. And of course, when we take a look at the literature, many academics like myself, we liked success stories. So we tend to look at the places that have worked. We always look at the same examples. The problem is that beyond those examples, there are a lot of cases we know nothing about. However, having said that, the few analyses that are comprehensive, that take into account quite a large number of uh, initiatives, I'm thinking about some work I've been doing on Mexico with some colleagues, um, where we look at 40% of all Mexican municipalities, we're talking about almost 1,000 of the 200, uh, 2,500, or close to 2,500 Mexican municipalities. Just the simple thing, over the last 15 years of thinking about your development problems, getting different groups, stakeholders together, to think about what can be done, just that, without even doing anything, has implied that generally those communities are better off in terms of wealth, employment generation, and quality of life. So that's, that's a start. And it's something that we need to know much more to see whether those initiatives are working. But it, nothing, not, not everything is rosy. There are quite a lot of problems that we have to face. Because many of these communities at the local level, especially in the US, where inequality is concentrated within cities, but also cities and regions in other parts of the world where inequality is much more concentrated in bigger territories, um, face a lot of risk and a lot of constraints. The first constraint is capacity, which is probably less of a problem in the developed world, but it's a huge problem in, the emerging, in emerging countries. You go to places like Indonesia, where there has been strong devolution, many local districts that have left, been left to their own resources haven't got the capacity to organize the whole effort and to actually design, implement, and monitor uh, adequate development strategies. A second one, which is much more common across the, the globe, and is, I think you can see it every day in the US as we see it in Europe, is the whole problem of coordination. And there are two types of coordination problems. The first one is the vertical coordination problem across different tiers of government. The community level, the city level, the regional level or state level, and the federal level or central level. In which what we have is that very often um, there's a poor definition of who does what. And very often different tiers of government want to do the sort of things they think are going to get the biggest returns. And avoid altogether the more difficult sort of actions that generally benefit those that can be considered to be at the bottom of the pyramid. The problem is that when that happens, and that happens more often than we think, we end up, in some cases, with an oversupply of public goods and services. In the worst case scenario, and most cases, 
with an undersupply of essential public goods and services that are needed to kick off the uh, growth problem. The second type of coordination problem is the horizontal coordination across similar jurisdictions, different, different types of communities. What we have is a lot of bad guy like neighbor, um, uh, territorial competition sort of problems that very often are not growth enhancing. They are, in the best case scenario, zero sum, or they are uh, pure waste, as I would call them. The cases, the case of Brazil in the 1990s was uh, paramount in which foreign direct investment played states and cities against one another in order to make sure that they gain the biggest amount of resources from public funds. So they funded, or local localities, states funded completely their own uh, factories at virtually no cost for the multinational company, and the gain on aggregate for the country and even for the state was zero or actually negative because it detracted, it was a huge opportunity cost. Money that would have been used, better used for, let's say, training and education, job generation, uh, infrastructure development was wasted in subsidizing investment that would have gone in any case, not just to that country, but to that state that was bidding for it. And then the third problem is the institutional problem, which is linked to quality of government. Poor institutions are a big issue in terms of allowing this uh, capacity to generate more inclusive, more sustainable sort of development. Uh, we're seeing this in Europe. In Europe, there have, we have gone over the last three decades through great targeted efforts in the less developed areas of Europe, and some of them are really uh, poor in comparison to the core, to generate better infrastructure, more uh, skills, and greater levels of innovation. In some cases, those investments have been successful. But in very, many other cases, and we've seen it across Greece, southern Italy, Romania, for example, the barrier is poor institutions, poor quality of government. Through three mechanisms, mainly corruption, uh, lack of transparency and accountability by governments, and poor government effectiveness. I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, there has been an elite capture of rents. The poorer the quality of government in across European regions and cities, the greater the likelihood that these regions and cities are going to go in terms of infrastructure for prestige uh, glitzy infrastructure. They would prefer uh, highways or multi-highways, what we call the motorways, to secondary roads that very often address particular bottlenecks. The problem is that there's a lot of collusion between big infrastructure companies that want big investments, big airports, big roads. The local elite says so elite capture of rents, but the returns for those communities in terms of employment generation, in terms of wealth generation, and sustainability have been very limited, if not outright negative. Those communities, those regions and cities that have better quality of government, even in less developed areas, very often have gone for a mix of infrastructure investment with highways but also secondary roads, and they have performed much, much better. It's also the case in terms of employment generation. When we, you make the analysis about what determines employment generation not at the high end, so the highly skilled, which is whether you are in a more educated, you have better universities, you have more firms. In the case of the poorest communities, is nothing related to that. The biggest barrier is poor institutions, and within poor institutions is high levels of corruption. So whatever you do in order to increase the skills is always going to face this glass ceiling that corrupt governments are going to make labor markets, contribute to make labor markets less transparent and prevent those at the bottom from getting uh, jobs. So what we see is that we have a situation in which there are a lot of opportunities. And there's a lot of greater conscience at the level of communities, cities, and regions that they need to find their own solutions. And this is positive. But unless we, and when I say we, is um, central governments provide help in overcoming the local barriers that I mentioned, the low capacity, the coordination problems, and uh, also the institutional problems 
at the local levels, many of these efforts are going to be wasted. If we manage to overcome those problems, the likelihood that local initiative is going to generate greater employment, but more sustainable employment, and employment that generates greater innovation and economic growth over the long period are going to increase, and that should be the way we should go. So thanks for that, uh, Andres. You know, that, that, that's a perfect point. I want to transition over to, to Lance. And you made the point in your comments that uh, economic growth does not necessarily translate into lower inequality. You opened up with that. Um, but economic growth can also really uh, intensify um, uh, the tensions in our housing markets. And I think that that leads us um, to Lance's area of expertise. And, and so I want. Lance, I want you to talk to us a little bit about the policy and programmatic levers that are available at the local level specifically. Um, when we start thinking about things like gentrification and displacement in communities, these innovative communities that are experiencing economic growth, uh, that are gaining these jobs um, that both Harry and Susan have talked about, um, what can we do um, in those types of situations uh, specifically as it relates to housing? Sure. Um, thanks for inviting me to, to participate in this panel. I think this is a, a very important topic that we're up here uh, discussing. And uh, I'll, I'll preface what I'll say by um, emphasizing I want to make two points. I think there are a number of things that can be done at the local level um, with federal state help as well in terms of addressing the need for affordable housing in communities that are experiencing significant economic growth. Um, I also though, would, would want to add at the end that I think if we're talking about inclusive communities that um, oftentimes it takes more than just thinking about affordable housing and, and how to keep housing affordable. So to return to the first point in terms of what are some levers or what are some mechanisms that we can think about, um, I think you know there are a number of programs that are available for affordable housing. Many of you in the room probably work with them or are familiar with them. Um, there are some that I think are particularly well suited for places that are experiencing economic growth, right? Because um, there are some housing programs, for example, such as the housing voucher program that doesn't necessarily translate into helping people move to places that are growing economically. Um, in contrast, uh, what you, I think we want to do is think about um, putting in place mechanisms that allow people to stay or continue to move into places that are experiencing economic growth. Such, for example, inclusionary housing programs can, if done correctly, achieve that end. Typically, the way they work is that when new development occurs or is proposed, a certain amount of the housing has to be set aside to be made affordable for low income or moderate income households. In New York City, we just went through uh, a fairly contentious battle to get New York City's inclusionary housing program amended under our current mayor. Um, the way the program works, the city uh, or if a developer and working with the community, if they decide to, inc they decide to increase the level of density in a particular neighborhood or allow for a higher density of development than was currently there previously, that's allowed as long as the new development also includes some affordable, a certain uh, proportion of affordable units. So the, the thinking there is that you both at the same time are allowing for more growth by increasing density, but you're also making sure that some of the development is set aside for affordable housing. And so the idea is that that will encourage people, that will make the, um, allow people to stay in the community. It's also a way of getting around the shortage or the, the uh, unavailability of funds to build affordable housing because by allowing developers to build to much higher densities, you're allowing them to earn higher profits and you're allowing them to cross subsidize affordable housing. Um, I see a sign that I should stop you're for. No, 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 you're uh, good. No? You're good. Okay. Go okay. right ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, I didn't want to go over too long. No, no, you take uh, your time. So, uh, so, so, that I think, so I think strategies like that, I think we can also think about other existing uh, subsidy programs, tailoring them 
so that they would allow for more development in areas that are growing rapidly. For example, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program has long um, given developers incentives to build affordable housing in difficult to develop areas or in areas that have relatively poor. And I think there's much, you know, there's good arguments can be made for building affordable housing in those areas. But you could also make an argument that maybe additional incentives need to be put in place so that those credits could be developed more easily in more expensive areas. And with the recent release of the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing um, guidelines last year, I think we're recognizing that there is a need to be able to develop affordable housing, not only in areas that are, are uh, currently more affluent, but in areas that are changing and will perhaps over time become more affluent. I think in the past, much of our affordable housing policy has been designed in a way that it tends to uh, reconcentrate or uh, almost cement low income and moderate income households into neighborhoods that are relatively poor. And I think what we want to do is put in place policies and mechanisms that allow people to remain in place. And so the idea essentially is, is relatively straightforward is to target subsidies to those spaces or places that are experiencing rapid economic growth. The second point I wanted to make though, I think in terms of thinking about an inclusive community, I think that that's important and it's, I think it's very, um, very necessary that we put in place those mechanisms. But I'm not sure that that alone will result in, um, necessarily result in an inclusive community. And I say that for at least two reasons. I think first of all, as many of the panelists have alluded to, um, we need an on-ramp or we need mechanisms to develop the human capital of people living in these communities. Um, in some ways, it's easier to redevelop or revitalize places as opposed to people, right? And I think we want to be careful in not getting confused with ec the economic growth of a place versus what's happening to the people who are already living there. And I think if we want economic growth that benefits people, we need to marry the affordable housing initiatives with initiatives such as those mentioned by some of my colleagues on the panel that will develop their human capital, that will develop education and the like. The hard truth though is that it's, it's difficult to redevelop, to develop people's human capital and it takes time. In some ways it's much easier to go into a place and if you're successful to turn it around and attract new investment, uh, but the people who are living there oftentimes might be left behind or not included in that process. So I think when we think about, uh, when I think about an inclusive community, I think the affordable housing component is important. In many of these places, I, I'm in New York City and I've seen how many neighborhoods have transformed and went from um, abandonment, disinvestment to now centers of hipsterdom or whatever you would like to call it. Um, and along with that very expensive housing and Oftentimes, the people who were there years ago, however, their economic circumstances have not necessarily changed in the same way. So even if they have affordable housing, they're fortunate enough to live in public housing, for example, and they're not at risk of being displaced, they're still not fully incorporated into the new economic circumstances. And I think when we talk about an inclusive community, we need to think about how do we allow those people to not only remain in these spaces physically, and I think the affordable housing mechanisms that I talked about very briefly, I think can help with that, but how do we allow them to participate in the economy as well? That's a great point. Um, so, and thank you for ending. I think the, the two points you made about intentionality, uh, that we need to be intentional about these things and we need to think about the, the connections between the people and the place. Um, so we're gonna pause there. We have a couple of minutes um, to take some questions from the audience. Um, I, I think um, there's been a lot of discussion on the panel about uh, some of the components that we need and some of the strategies. And I know uh, that we have several people in the audience who are in fact um, doing work that very much speaks speaks to um, those, those broad connections. So um, there are two microphones on the floor. Um, Jeff, hey, how are you? Thank you. It's a great panel. Hi, Susan. It's um, really great that the Fed does this every couple of years. It's a great meeting. I'm Jeff Hornstein. I work for the City of Philadelphia in the Controller's Office. Um, and I wanted to address something about labor markets, which has not been said by anybody, which is kind of stunning to me. 
There's really no such thing as a bad job. Steel mills produced millions of bad jobs until the steel workers came and organized them. I heard someone mention the union word in passing. I'm wondering why no one from the AFL-CIO or the labor movement is here, because the number one way to increase job quality would be to implement Canadian-style labor laws in the United States. That's point one. I'd love some response to that. One other thing about local economic development that's happening in this city and other places are attempts to use our local institutions, our anchor institutions, as levers of growth, sort of a hyper-local version of import substitution. I'm sure John Fry is going to talk about that later. But I'm wondering if folks have thoughts about that kind of a model um, for producing kind of an export-oriented economy by using local demand. Sure. Yes, Susan, do you want to? Well, I think maybe we should the first question, Harry, probably. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the sort of union labor law argument. Um, uh, so right now, employers mostly determine the quality of jobs, uh, again, based on, on this high road versus low road versus in between strategy. Yes, unions do raise job quality wherever they appear. The problem is uh, less and less they don't appear anywhere. Let me just throw out the sort of central fact. Uh, in 1955, uh, one third of the private sector was uh, unionized in America. Now it's about 6%. Public sector is made up for some of that loss, but, but, but only a small amount of it. Uh, and, and now the, the public sector unions are, are on the decline. Uh, and, and, and you can blame it all on labor law. And you can say, well, why don't we just pass more progressive labor laws? Ain't happening, right? Labor law was a failure in 1978. It was a failure in the Clinton administration. It was a failure. EFCA, Employee Free Choice Act, didn't get off the ground. You know, there's, even when the Democrats fully controlled Congress, there was no appetite for the kind of broad structural labor. So, so it's just not, it's not going to happen. Um, and, and I would argue, I'm not even sure, and, and this is a more controversial statement. I think, I think labor markets have become, in, in a world of technology and globalization, labor markets become more competitive in many ways, uh, uh, given employers many more choices. Unions have a toolkit that was very appropriate for the middle of the 20th century. It was very successful. I'm less convinced that it's appropriate for the kind of dynamic labor markets competitive that we have in the 21st century. People are racking their brains, well, what other kind of institution can give workers voice and improve uh, labor quality? And I, I haven't seen anyone come up with brilliant answers to that. So, so I, I just have to be pessimistic about the possibility of this revival of unionism uh, in, in the 21st century markets we live in. So let me take on the uh, second question that you asked, Jeff. And this we can be very positive about. And we can be positive about uh, in cities in general. Cities are often where we have education facilities. Education is a prime export of the United States to the world at large. And it is a burgeoning sector. And in cities particularly, we often have uh, a concentration of higher education. And the knowledge creation that's occurring in, uh, in cities is often occurring in conjunction with educational institutions. The difficulty and the challenge and the next step is to integrate the growth of the knowledge economy with the growth of skilled workers who are not currently possessing the skills we need. So now we're back to the kind of suggestions that Harry Holzer and Andres rodriguez Posse have in their papers for regional cooperation that puts together private sector jobs with supply of skills from educational institutions at all levels. Uh, the uh, Drexels of the world, Philadelphia Community College of the world, and of course, in your communities, the skill generators down to K through 12 and pre-K as well. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. Right here. Hi, you? my name is Meredith Levy from Somerville Community Corporation. Um, I have a question, actually it was similar to the last question, um, about standards actually. Unions in Boston area are still pretty strong, but that doesn't necessarily mean pe people have access to the unions. There are a lot of people who get cut out from that. And so I'm wondering from federal or state governmental level, what kinds of standards um, we should be pushing for prevailing, you know, unions talk about prevailing wage, but are there other ways to take from the fair housing example of further affirming access? Could we do that for the labor market so that um, instead of being uh, blocked from getting people into these jobs, how do we make sure that employers 
are required to meet certain standards to improve the access to jobs, especially people of color, women, and by zip code. So Harry, I don't know if you want to take a, a shot at that question. And Andres, if there are examples that you have um, from Europe that would help inform uh, that, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear your examples as well. So Harry? Uh, so, so there are a number of, of standards, depending on, on how broadly you want to define them. The most obvious being the minimum wage, sort of the, the, the basic wage standard. And look, I'm an economist. You know, I think pushing up the minimum wage too far is counterproductive. You know, and Zav earlier talked about how, how that debate has changed. I'm comfortable going up to 9 or 10. I'm really uncomfortable going up to 15. I think that will destroy large numbers of jobs for low-wage workers. So you can, you can raise standards. I think you have to do it carefully and sensibly carefully and sensibly. But on other dimensions, you know, occupational safety and health, um, uh, EEO kinds of standards and making sure that that's a way of, you know, strong EEO enforcement. Uh, uh, and, and, and EEO is actually these days on, on the interest of, of you know, it, it's, it's very illegal for employers to have a blanket policy of not hiring anyone with a felony conviction, uh, and yet it happens all the time anyway. You know, that kind of EEO policy is important to me. But let me give you another example. People often talk about if, if, we, have, if, we, have a, if we have a major new investment in infrastructure the next few years, uh, which at least some presidential candidates are talking about, some folks say, well, why don't we have a, 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 a require, you know, th these requirements to hire X percentage either of low-income youth or minority youth or, or local. And that's also something which I'm broadly sympathetic to, but, but you, if, if it gets too restrictive, then you're, you're making it more costly and making it harder for the infrastructure projects to proceed. So I, so I just think you have to think of what's the right balance between those competing needs. But, but I think those are at least some of the standards that, whether it's state or local or federal, uh, could be pushed, to, to me, at, at a sort of moderate level. Well, if I, if I can intervene on this. Uh, in Europe, we have some of the highest standards you can imagine. So uh, the sort of things that people in America would think are job destroying. So we have very high levels across the board of uh, minimum wages, high level of uh, social protection. I think it was the safety net that was mentioned by uh, Asaf here. And uh, a lot of uh, long periods of redundancy pay. So in principle, uh, that would be something that is uh, linked to destroy, uh, destroying jobs. And to a certain extent, that is not preventing companies in Europe from increasingly moving out of Europe, outsourcing, and setting up shop in places initially was Romania, now that Romania is becoming more expensive, it's India, it's Bangladesh, etc. And it's trying mainly jobs for the low skilled uh, at, the, at the bottom end. However, this is creating problems in certain parts of Europe. Uh, the textile sector in places like uh, Italy is being destroyed, with the exception of the high-end levels of the luxury goods. But in other cases, it hasn't been that. And the question is why? I'm going to put the example of Denmark. Denmark is uh, actually well known for biotechnology, is very well known for nanotechnology, but is also very well known for furniture production. And the question we're going to ask is why furniture production? In principle, a table is just a board and four legs. It can be done much easier in Indonesia at much lower cost than in Denmark, where you have the highest level of unionization in the world, uh, the highest salaries, and the highest level of social protection. But they have a system like in, and when I mention Germany, you can talk about Germany, uh, you can talk, uh, sorry, Denmark, you can talk about Germany, you can talk about Sweden. They have a system in which it combines quite a lot of things. It's the flex security system in which there is flexibility to hire and fire, but there's also a high level of security. But on top of that, there's a lot of vocational training and on-the-job training. People are being constantly trained. It's not that they work, they're being given the incentives to go up to the next level to make sure that they skill, their skills do not become redundant. If you have any sort of job, and I said there might be bad jobs in this respect, that just provide jobs in the short term but no upgrading of skills. The skills that you gain when you go to school or university become in a world where uh, um, technical and skill cycles become shorter and shorter, quickly redundant. The only way is through constant training, through vocational and especially on the job training. And that has prevented or maintained that a lot of low skilled people in very traditional sectors like in Denmark have managed to upgrade their skills constantly to be able to remain employable despite the fact 
that many of their companies are increasingly producing at the lower end in other parts of the world where costs are cheaper. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you for the comment. And I want to um, ask you all to join me in thanking our panel, Lance Freeman, Harry Holter, Andreas uh, Jose Rosa Rodriguez, and Susan Walker. Um, we have uh, a short break uh, this afternoon before we go off uh, uh, to our concurrent sessions. Uh, there's staff in the hallway. If you all have any questions about where you need to go or need some additional information, please don't hesitate to stop anyone and ask. Thank you so much.